All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Francis Galan, and I teach history at Texas A&M University, San Antonio. I am honored to have been asked to present about Antonio Gili Barbo. In the image, you can see a statue of Ibarbo placed in the heart of Nacogdoches for the public to see. Yet Ibarbo himself remains rather a mysterious figure in early Texas history, and certainly overshadowed by the likes of Stephen F. Austin, as well as prominent Tejano figures from San Antonio. Among many questions we may consider, I raised some here as I was specifically asked to focus upon the period of Ibarbo's life during the 1770s. And so we have then, when did Antonio Gili Barbo emerge as a leader in East Texas? What events occurred during the settlement at Bucareli, 1774 to 1779, that made the Spanish government so anxious about East Texas? What factors led to the establishment of Nacogdoches in 1779? And what roles did Ibarbo play specifically between 1773 and 1783 that led to his own troubles with the Spanish government. A marker placed at the feet of Ibarbo's statue reveals some clues to the questions just raised. And so you can see then that the inscription on the left hand side of the column in this marker reads, born in 1729 in Los Adias, province of Texas, died in 1809 at La Lucana, his ranch on the Arawak Bayou, Lieutenant Governor of the Pueblo Nuestra Señora del Pilar de Nacadoches, Captain of Militia, Chief Justice, Judge of Contraband Seizures, Indian Agent for the Spanish Crown, founded Spanish Nacadoches in 1779 between Banita Creek and La Nana Creek at the crossroads of El Camino Real and El Calle del Norte. There is also Ibarbo's old stone fort that was reconstructed and is located on the campus at Stephen F. Austin State University in Nacogdoches. Originally built to facilitate his role as an Indian agent for the Spanish crown and would lead to some of his own legal troubles over smuggling. With so many roles Ibarbo served, you'd think there'd be a published biography about his life and times. However, there is none apparently aside from an unpublished manuscript in the special collections at Stephen F. Austin State University. The best discussion of him appears in a wonderful work seen in the image on the right of your screen by historians Don Chipman and Harriet Joseph. Chapter nine of this book is on the Mar Marquez de Rubí as the imperious inspector and Antonio Guilibarbo as the father of East Texas with nearly 10 pages of this chapter about Ibarbo. Overall though, Spanish East Texas is largely neglected. My own interest in Ibarbo came about naturally from my book about Los Adias, published in 2020, where Ibarbo was born, raised, and resided for the remainder of this fort's existence until 1773, when it was ordered abandoned by the King of Spain and part of the so-called Bourbon reforms to make the Spanish military and economy more efficient and competitive in a world increasingly dominated by England on the high seas and independent Indians such as the Comanches on the Southern Plains. Perhaps part of the oversight, not only of Ibarbo's life, but Spanish East Texas generally is the lack of visible surviving missions like San Antonio, as well as the different physical environments, indigenous relations, and demographics. But that also includes the problem of very fluid colonial borders of Texas with the Texas-Louisiana borderlands, the Southern Plains, and South Texas, such that, as you can see in the slide on the map of Texas in the mid 18th century, Spanish Texas was much smaller than how we think about clearly defined borders of the modern Lone Star State. Meanwhile, this image of Spanish troop movements from Los Arayas made me realize that Ibarbo largely stayed in East Texas and focused his time upon trade in Louisiana from Natchitoches to New Orleans, especially after the transfer of Louisiana from France to Spain. He specifically emerged as a leader in East Texas during the summer of 1773 
after Lieutenant Joseph Gonzalez, a veteran of Los Adias dating back to its founding in the early 1720s, died while leading the Adesenos, or the people from Los Adias, out of Los Adias following the order of the king to close it down along with the Spanish missions in East Texas. I describe this chapter in my book as the Trail of Sorrows, since as many as 45 Adesenos, including 10 children, died either along the Camino Real en route to San Antonio or soon thereafter, and San Antonio having become the newly designated capital of Texas by September of 1773. Already the following month, Ibarbo led a petition effort of about 76 fellow adesenos asking for permission to return to East Texas because there was ostensibly no suitable place for them to settle in San Antonio. He traveled as far as Mexico City to plead before the viceroy, who then granted their request, but only allowed these adesenos to return halfway eastward between San Antonio and Natchitoches. By early 1774, Ibarbo and his fellow settlers established Nuestra Señora de Pilar de los Adayas, uh, del de Bucareli, on the lower Trinity River near a spot called Paso de Tomás, presumably at the crossing of the lower Camino Real, where Badai Indians lived and traded previously with governors from Los Adayas. Meanwhile, a smaller group of Adesenos remained behind in San Antonio to await their luck on being granted land of their own. It was not long before Spanish officials became concerned about contraband trade at Bucareli, as we can see from the document on this slide. It appeared business as usual for the Adesenos. Don Hugo Oconor, or the Red Beard, who had been interim governor of Texas in the late 60s when the Marquez de Rubí inspected Los Adayas and recommended its closure, and later became Commandant Inspector of Presidios for the newly created Department of Interior and Provinces, distrusted Ibarbo and suspected him of being involved in smuggling in East Texas and Louisiana. Fortunately for Ibarbo, he had a wingman in Governor Baron de Riperda who supported his request to return to East Texas. And so you can see here the translation of this document that shows that the people continue, the people from Los Adias continue on the Trinity River where they founded Bucareli and the contraband that they commit, they can do so easily from there. The concerns over smuggling at Bucareli continued throughout 1775. And as you can see from the document on this slide, Spanish officials still opposed the idea of free trade while Spanish mercantilism remained in place despite the Bourbon reform attempts at opening somewhat of the economy, yet also intended to stop smuggling. From this document, I picked up the notion of the adesenos engaged in free trade or smuggling depending upon how one views the situation in the Texas-Louisiana borderlands. And so you can see here in the translation, it refers to they, the settlers from at Bucareli, trading freely in tobacco with the French and Indians of the nations of the North. And the key term there is comerciando libremente, or literally free trade. In this report from Governor Riperda in late eight, uh, 1777, the Bucareli settlement was third in size for the province of Texas with 347 total residents, behind San Antonio de Bejar with 2,060 residents, and La Bahia with 696 residents, which is basically the same proportions, though slightly less in size, for Las, Los Adayas before abandonment. As I noted below, um, on the slide. And you can see uh, in this note, by this date, Ibarbo was married to his wife, Maria Padilla, and they had four children, two boys and two girls. He became a widow after Maria died in 1794 and subsequently married Maria Guadalupe de Herrera in 1796 while in San Antonio, where he had been charged with smuggling before being allowed to return to Nacogdoches in 1799 with his second wife and eventually died in 1809 
at age 80. This slide also shows that those residents in Bucareli included a militia company of 53 men and their officers. So Bucareli was basically the town that Los Adayas would have evolved into, just not at the same location. Meanwhile, Ibarbo's importance to Spain and regional power would also grow. Ibarbo made himself appear useful to the Spanish crown in terms of reconnaissance in East Texas. He mapped out part of the region that apparently was not a very accurate map and only raised more alarms about foreign traders. Ibarbo's subsequent report from Bucareli discusses the potential for greater settlement and development. He wrote, and just reading from the slide here, for this province to be one of the most abundant in the agricultural branches and the growth of both horses and bovine livestock, all that's needed are settlers to cultivate the fertile lands and establish ranches and farms for the many wild horses and livestock. With the continuation of the Spaniards and the most accessible and reducible friendly Indians with whom to promote with settlers in commercial dealings, which would serve to protect this jurisdiction to the south where the English have landed. Ibarbo's report continues with reporting about this English ship that had run aground at the mouth of the, ne of the Neches River in July of 1777, and also an Englishman that they found between the Trinity and Brazos rivers. There were English fugitives that were left with the Orcoquisa Indians, some uh, outfits with rich cloth and fine linens. And this was uh, part of a process that had been going on for a number of decades previously um, with French traders before arriving from Louisiana into Southeast Texas. In addition, Ibarbo's report mentions this abuse of permitted commerce with the sale of Indians and some Christian captives for resale in the jurisdiction of New Orleans. It's perhaps why Ibarbo will later be named judge of seizures and also Indian agent because he was the most knowledgeable about all happenings in East Texas, including the trade in Indian captives uh, and presumably rescue and ransom, even though Indian slavery was technically illegal under Spanish law. Ibarbo's services were considered so significant and noteworthy that he was promoted to captain in early 1778. And you can see here from the translation, for the good service and merit that Antonio Gilibarbo has contributed in the establishment of Bucareli, I've come to confer what his majesty grants me, the position of captain of those militias. And so it's a bit perplexing that he would end up being involved in contraband trade, that it ends up seeing becoming something more of uh, perhaps personal rivalries or jealousies, if you will. As to specific trade items that were mentioned in another report, this one from Athenese de Mazier, who was a commandant at Natchitoches and really kind of like the counterpart to, uh, to Ibarbo at um, Bucareli, we can see in this slide uh, that um, Spaniards from Louisiana provide the Indians powder, ammunition, rifles, linens, blankets, axes, knives, vermilion, and other merchandise. And again, these were the kinds of items that had been traded with the Indians over the previous decades uh, from French Louisiana. The reason for Spain's reactive concern about smuggling, especially during the 1770s, had everything to do more broadly with the increasing English threat to Texas, the American Revolution, and subversive ideas. For example, we can see this document, which is a copy of the royal decree in April of 1778, ordering the burning of all of the 1776 French and English copies of a work titled Año 2440, year 2440. At the time, 
the author was unknown as well as the publisher. And in the document, it is written, the book and the dominions of the kingdom promoting liberty and independence of the unruly toward their monarchs and legitimate officials. I've resolved that besides prohibiting this perverse book, that it be burned publicly. And you can see um, here, the copy of the King's Order from Madrid acknowledged by uh, Antonio Bonilla from Chihuahua, as well as acknowledged by the governor Gabello, who took over for Riperda in San Antonio. And you can see in the document, I, the king. Keep in mind the irony of this official call for book burning in 1778 was on the eve of Spain's declaration of war against England and by its family compact with France, both France and Spain became allies of the American patriots in their revolution against British rule. Spain just wanted to be sure its own subjects would not then turn against their own Spanish Bourbon monarchy. Hence, trying to cease the distribution of um, illicit books, as well as illicit trade, um, especially guns and ammunition um, and, and other ideas. So what we get are published works on Spain's contribution to the American Revolution, especially under General Bernardo de Galvez, who won decisive battles against the British, and after whom the town of Galveston, Texas is named, as well as Texas beef uh, that was exported overland from South Texas to Louisiana. However, Spain also wanted to be sure that they prevented England access to the Gulf of Mexico from ports along the lower Mississippi Valley that could facilitate attacks upon Spanish galleons and the silver trade in Mexico. Keep in mind that during the American Revolution, the British still had Florida that they acquired from Spain in return for the port of Havana, Cuba, which England had captured in 1762 near the end of the Seven Years' War. So Spain wished to avoid a repeat of such British attacks upon Spanish America. Meanwhile, in 1778 through early 1779, Spanish attention in Texas remained too occupied with a heightened state of war against Comanches, who had destroyed Mission San Saba in the Texas Hill Country the previous decade. Bucarelli basically then was left to its own devices. It quickly began to suffer from flooding, disease, and increasing threats from Comanches as well, reaching beyond the Southern Plains. For these reasons, its settlers decided to abandon Bucareli and move deeper into the Piney Woods and eventually established Nuestra Señora del Pilar de Nacodoches in the spring-summer of 1779, except this time without petitioning or asking for official permission from the Spanish governor or the viceroy. Their new location was at the site of the former Mission Guadalupe for the Nacodoche Indians, one of about 10 sub-nations of the former so-called Hassanai Confederacy. Had it not been for protection provided by the Tejas Indians, another sub-nation with whom the Spanish had traded from Los Arayas, and now with Bucareli settlers, the Camanches might have also destroyed Bucareli. According to historian Chipman, in 1779, Ibarbo had evidently filed a petition requesting from the government reimbursement of funds expended from his own wealth to relocate Bucareli settlers. And he also requested arms to defend Nacogdoches since there was no presidio or fort anymore. By October 1779, Teodoro de Croix, the Commandant General of the Interior Provinces, granted Ibarbo an annual salary of 500 pesos and gave him the titles of Lieutenant Governor and Chief Justice of Nacogdoches, as well as Captain of the Militia. Regarding the town's spiritual needs, Father Jose Francisco Mariano de la Garza took up residence in the old mission. According to historians H. Sophie Burton and F. Todd Smith, by 1781, if not sooner, Ibarbo had secured or resecured his own trade ties in Louisiana. For example, uh, trading with Athanese Poissat, a rancher with several operations in Opelousas located to the southeast of Natchitoches, and acquired slaves in exchange for cattle. And such, Ibarbo's trade apparently also took him 
to New Orleans. And so by 1783, Ibadbo recorded a population count for the town of Nacogdoches. And its population trend actually um, continued to move slightly uh, upwards. And by the 1790s, foreign residents were actually listed separately whenever a Spanish census was taken. This document, plus similar subsequent documents with the Spanish census records also reveal the diversity that existed in Nacogdoches by the late 18th century. You can also see on this document Ibarbo's own signature with rubrica or personal distinctive mark right down here. And here we have uh, Ibarbo as leader of Nacogdoches who enacts a criminal code to establish the rule of law and order in 1783. And some of the examples of some of these statutes uh, include um, um, blasphemy uh, against the God, our Lord and the Virgin Mary, uh, also a statue against speaking ill of the king, et cetera, uh, against uh, traitors who uh, shall suffer death and forfeit the whole of his property. You have another example over here, anybody who shall kill another shall be quartered alive previous to being hanged. Another one that talks about uh, any person who shall ravish a maiden shall suffer death, as well as the robber of sacred things shall hang. And then this one here, number 41, any persons convicted to be vagrants and to live in idleness shall receive 80 lashes as prescribed by law and be expelled from town. And so, this was Ibarbo in one of his many roles, uh, first at Bucareli and then at Nacogdoches. While he was in San Antonio, due to his second contraband trade charges against him, he made a will. And this is dated, uh, this will that was dated May 19th, 1800. He listed a couple houses in Nacogdoches, ranch property, livestock, some slaves, law books, he had debts, and also lots of other personal property. In a work titled Two Centuries in East Texas, published in 1932, Dr. George L. Crockett argued that Antonio Aguilar Barbo was Texas's first revolutionary. Dr. Crockett added about a Barbo and his contemporaries that Early was the love of independence born in their breasts and grew and was nourished there until it became the source from which wave after wave of revolution swept across the Texas province, each one bringing them nearer to the goal of liberty. Many years later, Lucille Fain wrote in her article published in the Nacogdoches Daily Sentinel, August 15, 1974, that the Spanish leader who laid Nacogdoches out as a town with blocks and streets in 1779 was also Texas's most prominent smuggler. However, she said smuggling was one of the chief manifestations of that love of liberty, which detached Texas later from Mexico. Most authorities credit the revolutionary movement to the Anglos who began coming into the state in the late 1790s. But Dr. Crockett starts this trend 100 years earlier with the colonists from Spain. Indeed, Latin American historian Sean Miller, in his work titled An Environmental History of Latin America, published in 2007, notes how settlers felt handcuffed under Spanish mercantilism with its restrictions against free trade and the imposition of imperial taxes. What is definitely certain, as historian Chipman states, and I quote, from 1779 onward, the town of Nacogdoches was permanently settled. This growing and viable community immediately supplanted the historic role of Los Adias, even though the townspeople were forced to defend themselves until the arrival of Spanish troops in 1795. And so in conclusion, whatever we may think about him here, Antonio Gili Barbo was an original pioneer of East Texas who became a hero to his people from Los Adias. 
held many roles as the founder and leader of Nacogdoches amidst rapidly changing events across multiple borderlands and left a lasting legacy that remains to be fully told. Thank you.